Thanks for joining the Weave user group. I hope everybody can see and hear me. Uh, hopefully you're joining today to uh, hear a talk on Java microservices and observability. So uh, if you haven't joined our Weave user group before, well, welcome. This is your first time. Uh, this is not a normal Weave user group uh, meeting. Normally we meet on the second and fourth Tuesdays of every month uh, where we have guest speakers uh, and the season goes from approximately uh, February through June. So we'll be wrapping up this spring season and then we'll be kicking off again uh, starting in September. Um, but intermittently, we also have these free talks um, by our very knowledgeable uh, team here at WE. So today is a free talk by Luke Marsden, who if you've joined us before, you've seen him many times um, speaking on very various topics. So, and there's Luke, yes. Cool. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, observability beyond logging for Java microservices. Um, and in particular, what I mean by observability beyond logging is that I'm sure that, um, that, that most people in the audience here um, are already familiar with the idea of log aggregation. Um, the idea that <coughs> if you have uh, multiple services um, in a cluster um, or even multiple instances of one service, it's very common to aggregate the log messages that those services uh, that those services output uh, into some sort of centralized uh, logging system like Logly or an Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana uh, deployment that you might be running yourself. Um, this talk um, is is about uh, other ways of getting observability um, on your application beyond uh, just log aggregation, because log aggregation is is fairly simple. Um, if you're not using it yet, you probably should, uh, but um, it's kind of table stakes at this point. But there are some very, very interesting uh, ways of improving observability into your applications um, that have especially recently become, uh, become very popular. Uh, so I'll talk about those uh, and give some examples and uh, a demo of some of them at the end. Um, just before I do that, I, I want to take sort of 30 seconds to, to explain why I'm here and why we care about this. Um, and so, so very openly and honestly, we, we care about observability for microservices because we have a product that provides, as part of its feature set, observability for microservices. And um, the goal of our product, we've cloud, is to help developers, uh, software teams go around this loop faster. Um, in particular, um, we have, um, uh, well, so I'll just describe the loop. Um, so the, the loop is that you uh, start with a development team um, and you have an application, and then you might have um, uh, new ideas uh, for features, and those ideas uh, get turned into software uh, by your software team, and then they get shipped into a CI system that then uh, outputs Docker images. Um, and so the first part of our product with cloud helps you take those Docker images and get them deployed safely, reproducibly, and, um, uh, and undoably into production, um, reversibly into production. Um, and at that point, that's where the observability feature set uh, that we have comes in. Um, there's a little Prometheus logo here because the, one of the things that, uh, that we've cloud has is built in uh, time series monitoring. Uh, that allows you to scrape metrics from your application and ship them up into this box, which is our uh, monitoring tool. And then we also have a visualization tool um, called Weave Scope uh, that's available as part of Weave Cloud. And that helps development teams figure out what problems are in production and then ship fixes back around this loop as quickly as possible back into uh, their production environment. Um, and yeah, observability uh, is what I'll focus on in this talk. Um, and that's sort of this aspect of, of the product. Um, oh, yeah, so I've got the slides with the, uh, with the stars as well. Uh, so the two things we help you do, uh, we take a, a feature uh, and ship it into production via the deploy feature. And you've got a problem, um, we help you fix that problem by shipping a fix for it back around the loop as quickly as possible. OK. Um, and the. Uh, value proposition that we have with uh, with this and observability in general is that the competitiveness of your software team is really a direct function of how fast you can go around this loop. Okay, uh, I see some messages in the chat, so I will see um, what people are saying. Um, 
Uh, yes, this webinar will be recorded, I believe. Um, and uh, regarding the HIPAA PII PCI compliance question, um, I will have to get back to you on that, um, but I believe so. Okay. Um, cool. So, um, so the point I'm trying to make on this slide uh, is is just a little bit of background on on container orchestration. Um, so, um, so who here? If you can just say sort of yes or no, who who here in the chat um, is uh, is using or is aware of Docker? Yes or no in the chat. Okay. So I haven't seen any no's. <laughs> cool. Okay. And we also have another question here, which is how does Weave Cloud work with Helm charts? And it's funny that you ask because I've been talking to my colleagues about that today. Um, the the answer is not yet, uh, but we are working on that. Um, so uh, so yeah, watch this space. Um, Cool. So pretty much everyone knows what Docker is. I don't need to talk about Docker. That's great. Um, but Docker, of course, uh, is a good fit for microservices where you're trying to break down your application from a monolith into lots of smaller pieces. Um, of course, uh, any non-trivial application, um, you need to run on more than one machine. And so then you need to answer the question, well, how do I manage containers across multiple machines. And that's where something like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm comes in. Container orchestration is the answer to, like, how can I just uh, run my application across multiple machines without having to manually think about where each piece of that application should go. Um, so they're also known as container schedulers um, because the, they will schedule your workloads on, on different machines for you. Um, now, uh, what's common between Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, or Mesos with Marathon, and so on, and these other uh, container orchestration tools um, is that they provide networking. They provide some way um, of uh, different applications in different um, uh, pods or containers uh, being able to uh, talk to each other. They also provide service discovery, so they provide a way for different containers and different pods uh, to find each other so that they can talk to each other. Um, and that's all um, absolutely fine, um, except um, getting your application running on one of these container orchestration frameworks is actually the easy bit. Um, once you have it running there, uh, the key question that you, you then want to answer, especially in the context of the diagram I showed you earlier, is like if you've got a problem in production, how do you actually diagnose that problem and turn that uh, the result of that problem into a fix that you can ship back around the loop. And so that's the question I'm going to try and answer today. Like, once you've got your application actually running in production, how do you know how it's performing, how it's doing, and uh, what the error rates are, what the latency is like, and so on? And the answer to that question, of course, is observability. You need um, solutions so that you can observe your application when it's running in production. Uh, just like reloading the page in your browser isn't a good answer, um, and neither is uh, sort of a classic sort of externally um, based monitoring system like Pingdom. I mean, that's great for uh, simple sites, uh, simple websites, um, but uh, in terms of actually understanding what's going on within the system, not just when you look at the system from the outside, uh, you need observability tools. And so I'm going to make this simple statement that observability is at least <laughs> the sum of your logging infrastructure, your monitoring infrastructure, your tracing infrastructure, and your vis visualization capabilities. So uh, like I said uh, at the beginning, um, in this talk, I'm not going to talk much about logging because I feel like logging is pretty much a solved problem. That's well understood. But I'm going to focus instead on monitoring, uh, tracing, and visualization. Um, so I'll start with monitoring, um, and in terms of monitoring, especially with a system like Kubernetes, um, I would strongly recommend that people take a look at Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus is fast becoming the sort of de facto way of monitoring your microservices in Kubernetes. Um, and what is Prometheus? Well, it's a labeled time series database, and what that means is that it um, it basically is a database where the data type is a time series, and these data type and the time series are indexed by 
uh, these uh, key value pairs that say key one has value A, key two has value B, et cetera. Um, and uh, what is a time series? Well, a time series is just a list of timestamp value tuples. So uh, you can start with, for example, um, uh, saying at time T1, uh, the value was V1, and at time T2, the value was T2, and so on. Um, and you can put lots of different types of data into uh, a database like this. Um, these values are always just 64-bit floating point numbers. Um, but using these values, you can represent a number of different types of things. You can represent counters, which always go up and to the right, uh, gauges, which are more like uh, thermometers, which sort of can go up and down, um, and histograms, which uh, sample a distribution over time and then give you a snapshot of that, sample, uh, of, of that uh, distribution as it changes over time. Um, and using uh, the Prometheus client libraries, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, you, can use, uh, you can use a combination of the Prometheus client libraries and PromQL, which is the uh, language for querying Prometheus, uh, to make sense of, of these values. And I'll show you how in a minute. So I'll, I'll give a concrete example. Um, suppose we have a counter, uh, which is the counter that is the number of hits to a web server. Um, the first thing um, that we'll notice is that um, in this example, the counter is uh, being hit. The web server is being hit once a second for the first three seconds, and then uh, once a second, uh, 10 times a second for the next three seconds, and then back to once a second for the remaining time. And what you can do with PromQL um, is that you can say, find me the rate of change of that counter over three seconds. And what that really does is it transforms this graph into this graph. Uh, it means that it transforms this, uh, it finds the rate of change on a three second moving window uh, from this graph to this graph. And the way it does that is that it transforms, uh, takes one, two, and three, puts them vertically in a, in a table like this, then it chunks along by one and takes two, three, and 13, puts those in a table, and then it converts, it does that for all of the different uh, uh, values in, um, uh, in the heading here. And then um, it subtracts the uh, last value from the first value and divides that by the difference in time, by the time interval. And so you can see that's how Prometheus has, has done this transformation. So just on one slide, very brief overview. Uh, we'll talk uh, more about this, I'm sure, in future Prometheus trainings. Um, but uh, in this example, we've very, easy, very simply gone from a counter to a rate of change um, like that. So inside Prometheus, um, the, uh, or, or the way that you use Prometheus for instrumentation um, supports two types of monitoring, uh, both white box and black box monitoring. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what those are and what the difference is between white box and black box. Um, the, the metaphor is uh, it's a bit of a strange one, actually. So a, a black box is meant to be something that you can't see inside. Uh, you can only sort of poke at it from the outside. Whereas a white box, I think, would actually be better referred to as a transparent box, um, is the idea that you should be able to see inside the system and see how it works. Now, so imagine, um, imagine sort of a, uh, a, a piece of, uh, sort of a, 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 a clockwork uh, device, some, some old clock. Um, a black box monitoring technique would be just to look at the output of that clock. It would be to look at the, uh, um, uh, the way that the hands move on, on the face of the clock, for example. Um, whereas uh, a black box monitoring, sorry, a white box monitoring approach would be to imagine that you had an x-ray uh, machine and you could look inside the clock or you could take it apart and understand how it was working. And you could put monitoring um, on each of the, the springs and the levers and the knobs inside, um, uh, inside, that, inside that clock. So the same concept applies to software. Um, and uh, so for black box monitoring, um, the idea is that you have something like Pingdom, uh, where you're uh, sort of observing the system from the outside. Or, or similarly, uh, in, a, in Prometheus, you might have a, a, a gauge for the CPU usage of your machines. That really is sort of looking at the outside of the system, uh, because you're not actually looking inside the application code that you've written as, as a software team. Um, whereas white box monitoring is, is saying, like, actually, no, I want, to, I care about some specific business, I care about some specific metric 
um, inside the application. And if you have a queue, for example, that might be talking about queue length. Um, or uh, if you are building an e-commerce application, you might uh, want to measure the number of successful um, orders that were placed uh, versus um, uh, orders where, where users dropped off partway through making an order. And you can put anything you like into a white box metric. It's, it can be anything that you care about uh, for your application. Now, the way that you um, instrument, if you choose to do white box monitoring and not just black box monitoring, uh, Prometheus will work with both, by the way. Um, if you choose to do white box monitoring, then there's a thing called the Prometheus Client Library. Um, and this talk uh, is entitled Java. Um, and Prometheus works great with Java. Um, it also supports, by the way, lots of other programming languages as well. So if you're running Golang or uh, Node.js or, uh, or even .NET um, and lots of others, uh, then there's probably a Prometheus client library for you. Um, and so this example, this code snippet here, shows you that you can um, uh, implement a class in Java that's an HTTP monitoring interceptor class. Um, and uh, the thing that you do here is you declare a histogram um, uh, request latency, which is um, a histogram inside. Uh, th this histogram is being imported from the uh, Prometheus client library uh, for histograms. And you can name that histogram by saying it's request duration in seconds. You can give it some help text. Uh, you can specify label names. And then you register it. And label names, by the way, um, are in Prometheus. Uh, remember, we had uh, key value pairs uh, being used for um, defining the, um, the labels in Prometheus. So we might have uh, key one is A, key two is B, and so on. So what you normally have is you have a special label called name. And name uh, is, can get shortened, for example, to counter in this case. So this counter query actually means find me the uh, metrics that match name equals counter. Um, and um, so that name here is, is one of those labels. But you also can specify other labels, so service, method, route, or status code, for example. Um, and so um, this might be that you're just saying this is the request duration in seconds. But actually, um, I want to uh, narrow that down based on service. So this is a shipping uh, example. Uh, you can see on, Git, on the GitHub URL here. Um, you would specify that the service is the shipping service. But you might also have a user service and um, uh, a billing service and so on. And so this is really powerful because it means that you can ask uh, Prometheus for metrics for all of your services request durations. And it will show you all of them in a graph. And then you, based on whatever you need to look at, you can narrow down based on service by adding extra sort of specificity to your PromQL query. Um, so that's why people call Prometheus a multi-dimensional um, uh, query system or, or a monitoring system, um, because you can have as many dimensions as you like. Um, so each key can be considered, can be thought of like a dimension. Um, so here's an example, um, and we'll see a real example of this later when I do um, a little demo as well. Um, and um, so the example here is the request duration, um, the average request duration for all of the uh, components in, um, uh, in an application. And you can see here that um, uh, we're looking at the rate of change of the sum um, of the request duration divided by the rate of change of the count. Now, this might seem a bit confusing at first until you realize that this is actually just how you express show me the average in Prometheus, because the average request latency is the sum divided by the count. That's how you find an average. Um, so that's how you can look at the average request latency for a, for a histogram um, in, in Prometheus. OK, so next topic. Um, actually, any questions? Um, at this point. Um, so there is a question, what is the logging platform used by Weaveworks? Or to put it another way, do you use Elk or have some custom built uh, logging platform? So actually, um, we don't provide a logging platform um, in Weave Cloud. Uh, we, um, I believe that we ourselves use Logly. So we're a customer of Logly. Oh. Um, but there are lots of other um, logging platforms as well. So uh, don't feel that you have to use that one. 
What kind of overhead does Weave Cloud add? Uh, not much. Um, so uh, we do deploy some agents uh, that run on your machines, um, but they're designed to, uh, to use minimal amounts of CPU and memory. Um, and in fact, we just uh, announced a change to scope, which is the, um, the agent which collects metrics for the visualization tool um, that has updated it to use eBPF, uh, which is a very cool new um, uh, uh, piece of kernel technology, the Linux kernel, um, which allows it to much more efficiently track the network connections between different things. Um, Another question for, is there a white paper for a technical overview of Weave Cloud? Um, we don't, I don't think we have a white paper, but we do have a lot of very good documentation that's recently been, uh, uh, been updated. So I'll just uh, point you to that now quickly. Uh, if you go to weave.works and then click on docs. Um, then if you click on overview here, then you'll see uh, all of this rich documentation here that gives you concepts and then tasks. Um, and the concept section in particular has a lot of really great material in it, which is sort of equivalent to, to a white paper. It just hasn't been put in a PDF. Um, so I'll uh, also paste that link into the docs for anyone who's interested in that. That'd be great. Uh, got another question here, I think. Yes. Can I implement custom UI presentations other than counts, gauges, et cetera? For example, a graph. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to understand the question. So um, you can implement custom UI presentation. Uh, well, so you normally, um, I think the short answer is yes. I mean, any data type that you can represent in terms of a, um, in terms of a floating point number um, that changes over time that gets sampled. Um, uh, um, implement in, in your application. Um, but I'm a little bit confused when you mention a graph because actually a graph is the normal output type for all of these types of things. They're just sort of, the graph would be the time along the x-axis and the value of whatever the counter or gauge is uh, uh, over time. Um, on, on the y-axis. And I'll, I'll show some examples of that later. So uh, hopefully that's clear. Uh, if not, then, um, then we can uh, talk, talk about it more over time. Yeah. You uh, mentioned graph change over time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll be looking at graphs that change over time. Um, and that, that, so uh, yeah, counters and gauges uh, are normally graphed over time. Uh, although you can also look at the instantaneous count. Um, and Deepak recommended Grafana, uh, which is awesome. Yes, Grafana works great uh, as a way of uh, doing a dashboard for Prometheus to build visualization, exactly. Um, and, um, and the uh, nice thing about the Prometheus uh, implementation in Weave Cloud is that it works with Grafana because Weave Cloud just exposes a Prometheus API. Um, so you can, uh, you can literally just plug it in. Um, and in fact, if you search the docs for Grafana, Okay. then uh, you can integrate Grafana uh, into Weave Cloud uh, really, really easily um, just by specifying these criteria. Okay, uh, cool, great questions. I will uh, jump back to... Um, um, cool, so now tracing. Tracing is kind of cool. Um, so, these are, like all of these different things, by the way, are, are sort of different ways of slicing uh, the observability of, of your system when you're running it. So, um, so with Prometheus, you get this, uh, this graph that shows you the uh, time along the x-axis and the value of your PromQL um, on the y-axis. Um, but, but what this doesn't show you is the relationship between different components. So you can see here, for example, that the front end took five seconds to respond. Um, but it doesn't show you why. It doesn't show you why exactly, like where exactly was time spent uh, in, in servicing that request. Um, and so um, then um, tracing is a way of answering the question of sort of where was time spent during a distributed request. And so it's known as distributed tracing. Uh, another way of thinking about this is that 
tracing allows you to map the causality through multiple layers of microservices. Um, so um, in particular, I mean, this example here, this is actually a screenshot of a visualization tool. I'm just using it to visualize the example. Uh, the visualization tool in use here is Weave Scope. Um, but the, uh, in particular, what we're looking at is that there are some requests coming in from a load test uh, that are running on these machines. Those requests are hitting a front end. Uh, and then that front end is making requests to a user service, and that user service is making requests to a user's database, and the front end is making requests also to a session database. Okay, and this is all great, um, but um, we want to look at actual specific requests and understand what happened during that request. Now, if you're looking, uh, if you think about all the tools we've talked about so far, including logging, if you're looking at an aggregated log of all of the different log messages that were output by all of the different components in your system, then it's really hard to look at that huge stream of logs and actually understand the causality. What log message caused what other log message or what event in the system caused which other event and how long was spent uh, processing each event. Um, tracing is a way of solving this problem. So you can actually trace that the front end made this call to the session database, and then made a call to the user's database, and then made a call to the user's data, uh, to the, sorry, to the user's service, and then to the user's database. Um, and uh, if anyone, if, if people have ever heard of flame graphs, it's basically a very similar concept to flame graphs. Actually, I haven't put this in my slides, but I like flame graphs so much, I'm just going to Google them quickly so I can show you what I mean. Um, so. An example of a flame graph uh, from Brendan Gregg, who is excellent, by the way, looks a little bit like this. Now, a flame graph um, normally runs just on a specific machine, on one machine, and looks at sort of, and so what we can see here is how much time was spent in various different points within a MySQL server. Um, this, uh, uh, this is very useful because it sort of shows you visually, like oh, the, the most like a large part of the space, large part of the uh, time spent doing a query was inside this sort of this chunk here, and then there was some more little bits over here, and then there was another big chunk here. So you can really get a sense for for where the time is being spent, and it's super useful if you're trying to diagnose performance problems. Um, but the problem with normal flame graphs or CPU flame graphs that we're looking at here um, is that they only run on a single machine. And when you start doing microservices, then now you have a distributed system. And like I said, it's much harder to understand uh, the relationships between the timing for everything um, uh, across multiple services that are uh, running across uh, multiple machines, and where each service could also be sharded out across multiple instances of that service. Um, cool. Um, Yes, flame graphs are awesome, I agree. They look really nice, don't they? Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, slightly less pretty, um, but, but still very useful um, are um, open tracing, uh, or tracing, um, or, sorry, let me just call them traces of a distributed system. And um, so traces are defined uh, as spans. Now a span is basically a tree structure of events and so what that means is that spans can contain other spans and each span has a start time and an end time and spans can also be annotated with timing information and messages. So it's kind of like a richer form of distributed uh, tracing with logging sort of added as an extra bonus like annotations can be made on different points in time. Um, and um, if you've ever had um, a microservices system and something's mysteriously gone wrong, like you've got a 500 error message from maybe your front end, but you, maybe there's a bug and you haven't properly made the error propagation work throughout the entire system. So it's impossible to see uh, where in the system the error message actually came from. Maybe the error message was being swallowed um, all the way up the stack until, uh, until it just resulted in a completely useless 500 to the front end. And I say useless because it's hard to understand where the problem was. Um, 
Tracing can really save you here because tracing can actually highlight in red uh, which component first experienced an error. And so you can immediately just visually see uh, where the problem was. And what's more, as well as just being able to see where the error was, you can also, if you're having a performance problem, uh, you can see where the time was spent. So there's this front end request and you can see that it spent this much time doing a session lookup, this much time doing a user lookup, this much time uh, the user lookup uh, was spent doing a user database lookup. Um, and so I'll just, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of one of these in a minute, but first, a little bit more about spans. Um, so the way that these tracing systems actually work um, is that spans are communicated, that they're, cro they're passed across service boundaries whenever the services do an RPC to each other. So every time there's an API call, for example, uh, from uh, one service to another service, so the front end to the user's service, for example, um, on um, uh, that span, um, that I that you can see earlier uh, here sorry um, is is also transmitted so when when uh, the user requests something from the front end uh, there probably isn't going to be a span set specified in that request because users don't normally send uh, span IDs um, but as soon as that request gets handled by the front end a span ID will get generated and then every time there's a sub request that span ID gets propagated down to uh, the the sort of dependent service. Um, and this is normally done, um, uh, so each span has a unique ID. And this is normally done uh, by span IDs being injected into HTTP headers and extracted on the other side. So every time there's a client, i.e. the front end has an HTTP client in it that's making an HTTP request to the session service, um, that uh, HTTP client uh, takes the um, span ID that, that it generated or that it received from its caller and injects that into the HTTP headers. And um, that then sort of propagates all the way down the tree. Um, and so it's also worth noticing that in most programming languages, uh, spans are internally propagated between um, the code that is in the web server into the code that is in the web client, for example. So if, if you have uh, a microservice that's that exposing an API server, but also making API calls, then of course that microservice is going to have a server and a client in it. And um, the spans can be propagated internally within uh, that code, um, probably by using a context, at least in Golang, that's what I'm familiar with. Um, and then of course, there's how do you actually get all this information and assemble it? So uh, code that is instrumented with, with, with tracing like this, it reports, um, on an interval, I believe, it reports to a tracing server. Um, and that tracing server then reassembles the causality. So it figures out what, what happened when and what caused what to happen. Um, and it reassembles it into a picture that looks a little bit like this. So I've talked about tracing in general. Um, and unlike uh, Prometheus, where I just recommended one solution, um, there's actually something very cool in the tracing space called open tracing. Um, and open tracing is a standard API for tracing implementations. And what that means is it means that you can instrument your code once with the open tracing libraries, and then you can swap in and out different open tracing implementations. Uh, and there's lots of different open tracing implementations. And this is really cool because all these, all these different open tracing, sorry, all of these different tracing implementations grew out of um, tracing that was done inside various different um, large companies, generally. Um, and uh, they, some of them run, are in different, written in different languages. So I believe that AppDash is written in Go, I think, and Zipkin is written in Java. Doesn't really matter which one you use, but maybe you have a preference for one over the other, or you like the features of one more than another. If you instrument your code using the open tracing client library, then it means that you can use any of these different implementations and you can just drop them in. So that's pretty nice because open tracing uh, means that you're not locked into one specific tracing library. And I'll just give an example uh, of how to do, um, how to start a span in Java. Uh, there's lots more to read at the GitHub URL I, I pasted here. Um, but if you um, uh, are starting a new span, um, then, um, then you can just create one by saying, I've got, a, I've got some open tracing tracer. And then um, you can say active span is uh, build a span with a name and then start that span. 
Um, and you can then, everything you do within this, this try block uh, will then get annotated automatically with that span um, and, uh, uh, and can have, uh, for example, those span IDs propagated to uh, any sub requests that get created from inside, uh, inside that span. Um, so that's just a taste of open tracing for Java. Uh, there's lots more uh, where that came from. And then finally, I'll give you an example. Um, so you can see that this does look a little bit like an upside down flame graph. Um, I actually think they should reverse them and make them red and orange so that they look like flames as well, because uh, they look really cool. But uh, this is what Zipkin looks like, which is uh, one of the most popular open tracing implementations. Um, and so here we can see that there uh, was a client that did a GET request um, that then did a MySQL query, um, and then it did another MySQL query, and then it did a commit, and then it did a bunch of other stuff in here. And so you can see, um, oh, my GET request took 180 milliseconds. And if that's too slow, then you can go and actually understand, like you can, you can go straight to the cause of the latency rather than guessing based on, uh, on log messages or, or, or monitoring data that might not actually tell you the causality within, uh, within each of your individual requests. So just to reiterate, you're looking at one specific request that was traced all the way through the system here, rather than the average request latency over time like you would with a time series uh, metric. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about visualization next. Any questions about tracing? Yeah, in fact, does WeaveCloud provide tracing graphs like Zipkin um, to be specific, actually span graph, span graphing like in Zipkin? Uh, unfortunately not. We don't yet provide a tracing solution. Um, this talk was really meant to just highlight the different things that are available out there um, with a sort of side note of, well, we provide two of them. <laughs> um, but uh, if you're interested in tracing and would love uh, tracing to be provided as a service in Weave Cloud, then please reach out um, and let us know uh, because that could help influence the product roadmap for other features and capabilities that we add to Weave Cloud in the future. I personally think that would be awesome. Um, so thanks. Cool. Um, so the final thing I want to talk about is um, something you've actually already seen in my slides. Um, because uh, we, um, in, in one of my previous slides, I used an example showing, uh, I'll show you, uh, showing, um, I think it was this slide here, showing the different um, uh, parts of a distributed system um, to highlight the fact that tracing would, uh, would look at those different, look at a request as it passes through them. Um, the, the final uh, piece of the puzzle for me is also just having a way to visualize your system. Um, and so uh, this is one of the tools that we offer as part of Weave Cloud. Um, it's a way of drawing a live map of your application. And in Weave Cloud, it's called the Explore feature. There's also an open source project called Scope, uh, which is effectively the same UI, uh, just without some of the additional features you get in Weave Cloud. Um, and being able to see a live map of your application really allows you to understand the interactions between different components. So this, again, this isn't tracing individual requests like open tracing does. Um, and it's not showing you sort of the time series metrics like Prometheus does, but it shows you the shape of things. It shows you the overall structure of your application. And so you're able to see like, oh, I wasn't expecting this service to be talking to that other service. Or like, um, I, I think that this service should be talking to this other service, but, but it's not for some reason. Maybe I can look at the logs for that specific container and understand whether there are any errors coming out of the logs. Um, and it allows you to also drill down into the details um, uh, of each thing. And I think this is best demonstrated uh, with a demo. Um, so I will uh, go ahead and uh, uh, do a demo of um, the two pieces that, that are included in Weave Cloud. Uh, so that's visualization and monitoring. Um, so without further ado, hopefully my demo session is still live. Yes, it is. Uh, so um, just very, very quickly, this is uh, a Kubernetes cluster here. Uh, we've got an application already running on it. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is to hook that, app, that cluster up to Weave Cloud. Um, so I'm going to create a new instance. Um, with my observability talk. And then we cloud asks me what kind of cluster do I have? I'm going to say it's a Kubernetes cluster. Um, 
I'm going to do one more thing which just hooks up a few other pieces, which I'm not going to go into the exact details of why this, this piece is necessary, but it just hooks up uh, a container image registry um, and a version control system, which uh, we've Cloud also integrates with. Um, and I'm going to skip straight to uh, the, the demo where, uh, where we look at uh, the explore feature. So this is the visualization part um, of, um, of, of observability. So if we go and take a look, OK, so we've Cloud agents are now connected. Um, and as I told you, we previously had, um, uh, we already have an application running here on this cluster. Um, and so immediately, without any additional configuration, uh, Scope has just shown me what is there. So I didn't have to instrument each of these services to see what was running. I'm immediately able to see that the user's service is talking to the user's database. And for a second, it was talking to the internet. That's interesting. Why is the user's service talking to the internet? Uh, we might want to go and dig into that later. Um, but, um, but really what we can see here is that actually the, the application that we're looking at here is pretty quiet. Uh, each of the services that has a database is talking to its database, but nothing else is talking to anything else. Um, but if we go back, I think around, somewhere around here, there's a link to the shop. So this application that's running here is a sock shop. Um, and we can see that uh, we can go and uh, try and buy some socks, for example. Um, and as soon as we do that, we can see that the visualization tool starts showing things getting joined up. So we could see that request when I loaded that page at the front end, went and talked to the catalog, uh, and it went and talked to the card service. And so that's pretty interesting. Um, you can immediately uh, drill down into the uh, relationships between things based on the real network traffic that's happening between those components. And what's more, by the way, just FYI, you also have uh, lots of different Kubernetes concepts here. Uh, so you can see things from a pod level, um, a deployment level, uh, or even a service level. And this gets increasingly useful if you have more than one pod per uh, deployment, for example. If you scaled your application uh, so that the catalog service has lots of pods, uh, then in the containers and pods view, you'd get um, lots, of, uh, lots of things on the screen, whereas if you, sort of, you can zoom out in a layer of abstraction, into the deployments uh, inside this visualization tool. Um, and uh, that's pretty, pretty handy. Um, but um, I have intentionally broken the sock shop in a couple of interesting ways. Um, and so the first thing that, uh, because don't forget that observability tools are most useful when something goes wrong. Um, and so I'm going to start by looking at uh, trying to fix those problems um, that I've created in the sock shop. So we have to pretend that I don't know how the problems uh, were created. Um, so the first problem seems to be that when I try and add things to the cart, the cart just disappears. I mean, let me just log in for a second. Um, also, when I log in, it looks like logging in seems to be taking a very long time. So I'm it's curious. I don't know why that's happening, but um, maybe maybe the visualization tool. Um, in Weave Cloud can help me. So I'm going to go and look here. Um, and I can now see, yeah, the front end is talking to the user service and the card service. Um, but there definitely seems to be a problem with the card service because whenever I try and buy some socks, I click Add to Card, and nothing happens. And in fact, when I click Add to Cart, the cart icon on the screen um, disappears. So that's a bit mysterious. Um, what I can do is, um, you can see the front end talk with the catalog as well here. So what I can do is I can drill straight into the card service. I can look straight at the container, and I can click this button, which tails the logs instantaneously. I told you that Weave Cloud doesn't have log aggregation built into it, but it does have the ability to just attach to the current output stream of a container so that you can see uh, if, if that uh, container is spewing any logs up at that point in time. I'm going to try and add some more socks to the car, reproduce that problem. And I can see that uh, this is one unhappy Java process. Um, the Java process is throwing exceptions because it's timed out trying to connect to a MongoDB cluster. And so I've learned by looking at the visualization tool um, that there is a, a, a database that's missing from the cart service. So what I can do now um, 
is I happen to know how to go and fix that. I can run this one command uh, that will deploy the cart database, uh, the deployment file and the service file. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about Kubernetes, by the way, and learning more about these different types of things, then please come to one of our Kubernetes trainings um, that, we, that we also run. Um, and um, so when we deploy the cart database, we would expect to see immediate feedback um, in Weave Cloud. Uh, we would expect to see, uh, and we indeed we can see that the cart database has now appeared. And I reckon any moment now, the cart database, uh, the cart is going to reach out and connect to the cart database. Um, there we go. So you can see the fact that the cart is now correctly talking to the cart database. Uh, using, uh, using this visual mechanism rather than just having to tail the logs. Um, and um, additionally, if we go back here and now try and buy some socks, then we can see it works. Um, and if we try and proceed to the checkout, uh, then we can place an order. So the sock shop seems a lot happier now. Um, in fact, if we go back here, then I reckon we can now see sort of a fully connected or nearly fully connected grid, uh, graph of the front end talking to all the different pieces. And so you can really see the structure of things um, in, in this visualization tool. So um, there is also another problem that I, that I left in the sock shop. I intentionally broke it in a different way. Um, and in particular, I don't know if you can tell, but when I load the home page, it seems to be kind of slow. Like, loading the, the header is pretty quick, but then loading the actual pictures of the socks underneath it, that seems to be pretty sluggish. Now, if you're really in an e-commerce situation, then you know that that's going to kill your sock sales, and that really isn't OK. Um, so what we can do is we can use the monitoring tool, the mo Prometheus monitoring tool that's built into Weave Cloud, uh, to go and understand um, what the problem is. Now, remember I told you earlier that, um, oops, I can use my computer. Remember I told you earlier that, um, the, uh, that it's possible to ask Prometheus, show me the request latency for all of the things. Um, and so that's exactly what I'm going to do here. Uh, I'm going to look at the request latency uh, sum divided by the count. And that's going to say, show me the average request latency for all of my services. Um, and you can see that most of the services have this request latency down at 0 0.001. That's a nice, healthy request latency. But if I look up here, then I've got this variable request latency for uh, this job called the sock shop catalog. And so what's interesting here is that the monitoring system has allowed me to drill down into exactly which job caused the problem. So it's highlighting to me that the problem is in the catalog service. Because remember, before that, I didn't know what the problem was. I just knew that the home page was being slow to load. Um, and so what would be, uh, what, what's pretty cool about this is that Prometheus allows you to really drill down and just say, OK, I've got outlier latencies in the catalog service. And I might then go and take a look at the source code for the catalog service. And this is a Golang application. Sorry, I should have rewritten it in Java or, or picked a Java one for this talk. Um, but uh, just by way of example, um, uh, looks like someone's put a sleep statement in here. So we've got um, seeding a random number generator, picking a random number between uh, 500 and 1,000, and then waiting that number of milliseconds. Um, so uh, that explains the extra latency. And if we take out that sleep statement, and then delete this import here. Um, then uh, we can build and push a new Docker image um, that we're going to tag fast version. And with this fast version tag, um, uh, we should then be able to see uh, reduced request latencies uh, to the catalog service. OK, um, that's going to take a couple of minutes to build. Um, so does anyone have any questions while we wait for that? There was one earlier. Um, what regions is Weave Cloud deployed in? We have a few products which require data sovereignty requirements. 
Okay, that's interesting. Um, so I believe that Weave Cloud is currently deployed in US East, um, but we do have plans to go multi-cloud. Um, and if you could contact um, uh, contact us to um, uh, to mention uh, what your data sovereignty requirements are, uh, we may be able to accelerate the deployment of Weave Cloud into different regions. Um, and um, also, if you're interested in running a, uh, an on-premise version or a private version of Weave Cloud, um, then you should also come talk to us because uh, we're developing sort of our enterprise uh, on-prem offering, and we're we're looking for uh, people who who have requirements there to learn more about what those requirements are. Um, so yeah, please please get in touch. Uh, you can get in touch on our website, um, or you can uh, you can join our Slack channel. Um, if you go to weave.work/help. Um, then there's a Slack channel here. Uh, it'd be awesome to, to invite you there. Um, or uh, if you want to talk to us, you can also click a button here and um, have a chat with one of my colleagues um, directly through the website. Um, so, yeah, please, please do do that um, after the call. Okay. There's also, can I pull data from Kafka to Prometheus in real time? That's a good question. Um, I don't see why not. Um, so anything that you can publish on a slash metrics endpoint, you can pull into Prometheus. Um, so if you have a service that's talking to Kafka uh, and it publishes uh, metrics on a slash metrics endpoint, uh, then you could indeed um, uh, pull at least uh, those time series values um, into, into Prometheus. Uh, does, I hope that answers the question. Okay, so I'm just going to finish the demo quickly and then I'll take any other questions after that um, because we can see that the that, uh, fast version has now been pushed uh, to the catalog, um, sorry, to the uh, container registry. So I can show you the last feature of Weave Cloud, which really closes the loop. Um, and it was the catalog service that we updated, wasn't it? So we now have in the deploy feature of Weave Cloud uh, a list of what's running in the cluster. We also have a list of which versions of things are available. So we're able to see that there's the fast version is now available. I can click release. Weave Cloud is then going to figure out what to do. And it's going to say, oh, you want me to update the slow version to the fast version? And this is a dry run, so it lets you check that that really is what you wanted. And then you can click release. And that release uh, will then push out that latest version um, of the catalog service. Um, to uh, to the cluster. Um, you can now see that it's on the fast version. And by the way, you can also automate releases. So every time a new image shows up, it gets deployed automatically, which is great for, for example, for staging clusters. And you can also lock uh, releases to stop people um, uh, making new releases. Uh, for example, if um, if there's a bad version that's been deployed and you need to roll it, and you need, you want to roll it back and then lock it until the new version's been rolled out. Um, so anyway, we deployed the fast version of the sock shop, and now hopefully we should be able to see. Yeah, the home page is definitely loading faster now for me. Um, the image here is loading at the same time as the heading, so that looks like a success. Um, and in fact, if I go into Weave Cloud, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's look at the numbers. Um, look at the stats, and if we go in and look. Uh, if we zoom in here, we can see uh, a couple of interesting things. Oh, it wasn't actually the locking that I wanted to show you. So the first thing is that we can see that that fast version was released here on the timeline. Um, and then if we zoom in even further, so after that fast version was released, where we still had this high latency uh, sort of visible in this graph, if we now zoom in further, uh, we can see that this catalog is now down to 0 0.001 seconds latency. And uh, so after the release, uh, the latency is recovered. So indeed, uh, that new version of that microservice did improve the metrics. Um, and so just to reiterate, this is what Weave Cloud is all about. It's about closing this loop, making it faster, um, and uh, bringing observability tools uh, to you, making them easier to use and consume um, so that you can fix problems with your applications faster um, and um, and ship features faster. So um, I hope this was useful. Um, 
I'm sorry not to have demoed anything uh, about tracing. I, I ran out of time to, to do the tracing demo. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I hope it was a useful talk. Um, and don't forget, observability is the combination of logging, monitoring, tracing, and visualization. And finally, I'll say, um, if you're not part of our meetup group already, please join. Uh, you're very welcome to. We do lots of these talks. We also run some trainings. Uh, please also come and join us on Slack, weave.work slash help, and then you can just put your email address in, in this little widget. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Um, and I'll take any questions in the last 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. uh, give everyone one second, but technically, yes, we are out of time. And thank you for all of your questions throughout this presentation. So I think that's part of the reason we're out. So um, I guess we can cover the other topics in future talks and we'll make sure to include um, those updates for you in case you want to hear uh, about the rest of the talk. So thanks Luke again and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, again, if you haven't joined the um, user group, we'll have plenty more talks uh, through June and then other types of talks uh, during the summer. So thanks again. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and thanks, Tamo, for hosting.